Colorado Democratic Senator and potential 2020 candidate Michael Bennett made an announcement last night, but not exactly the one political observers were expecting. Bennett revealed to the Colorado Independent newspaper that he was recently diagnosed with prostate cancer, and he plans to have surgery during the upcoming Senate recess. The paper reports that Bennett is still committed to running for president if he's cancer free. Well, Colorado Senator Michael Bennett joins me now in his Thanks. first TV interview for doing this. Thanks for having me, Chuck. Well, uh, how you how are you, you feeling? Did you, do you feel any different knowing this diagnosis? No, I mean, you don't, nobody likes hearing that they have cancer, that's for sure, but I mostly feel overwhelmed at how lucky I am uh, because uh, we caught it early. Mm -hmm. It's something that can be dealt with, and I've got insurance. Uh, so, um, <laughs> but I, on the point about feeling different, though, uh, that is an important point. I feel fine. I feel yeah. perfectly fine. So if I hadn't had that screening as part of a physical, um, I wouldn't know that I had cancer. Did you do this physical because it's your annual, or were you yeah. doing this prepare for your? No, life? it was my annual physical, and I, um, and, and I went in. I felt fine, and they, you know, I won't give you the gory sure. details, but, uh, but the point I want to make to everybody who's watching is you got to get screened. That's the most important thing. And you, you've talked about you, you clearly called John uh, Kerry. Uh, the Democratic nominee. You clearly had a conversation with him. He went through this during his presidential well, campaign. Well, I haven't actually talked to him, but I'm oh. looking forward to talking to him. Okay. But he did. He uh, was diagnosed after he was in the race already, and he had the same operation I'm going to have. And two weeks later, um, he was back. Now, John Kerry is a machine, uh, right. and he always has been. That yes. was He's a fitness he, buff. He was 59 yeah. then, and I'm 54 today. But I, I think the doctors think it's going to be fine, and I think it's going to be fine. So, you're definite. If you get cancer free, you're 100 percent in. Yeah. There's no. Yeah. There's nothing. No. There's no ambiguity here no. anymore. Is no. It? No. <laughs> I put my family what? through enough. Yeah. I was just going to say, I, I, I don't, I don't want to get overly invasive about your family life here. But was this a? This must. You tell your family you want to run for president. You tell your family I have cancer. And I'm going to do both. Yeah. That had to not be the easiest conversation. No, it's pretty amazing. I mean, Susan, my wife, is unbelievable, and she's got her own career, too. And our daughters are 19, 18, and 14. And I called my 14-year-old today who was at school, and, uh, and I said, how's it going? And she said, well, everybody's being pretty nice to me. <laughs> but it is a lot to put on your family, and I, you know, I'm not a sociopath. Like, I, I'm, I care about how they feel. Uh, but I think they're committed to trying to make a difference here. You know, there's, I imagine anytime anybody has one of these, you hear the C word or you hear something, death in the family, it does sort of reorient you maybe about what you want to do. Did, did this actually, does this focus you more to Th run? That, so, so the gr best excuse for not running would be this. Like it gives me a, a you know, out. free pass if out. If you want, yeah, everybody would say, oh, that's yeah. right. So, and, and that's not how I felt. I felt like, you know what, uh, this is something I really want to do. I think I've got something to contribute. We need to focus on uh, what the country needs, to fo needs us to focus on, which is the fact that uh, incomes have not risen for 90% of Americans over the last 40 years. And that's where the focus needs to be, I think, in this campaign. And we need to be disciplined about it, or, or we could lose uh, to Donald Trump. And by the way, that's the other thing. Nobody needs to worry about me. We need to worry about the guy who's in the White House who spent his entire time as president mm. trying to take insurance away from millions of people in America, tens of millions of people who, because of his policies, might not have the kind of you know, screening that I had. It's interesting. You said that one of the reasons you're reintroducing Medicare X is after going through this, obviously, you're reinforces your view on universal health care. But let me ask you this about Medicare X, because I do think there's a dividing line in the Democratic field, which is, is it Obamacare, the infrastructure, and you improve upon that, or do you say, as good of an attempt as that was, shh, wipe it clean, start from scratch? Where are you? I think I'm more toward trying to use the framework that we have, but I don't feel like that has to be where we stop. I, I Look, I am for universal care. Everybody in America should have health insurance. If I didn't believe that before this, I certainly believe it now. I can mm -hmm. assure you of that. We need to spend less as a country, and, and our families need to have to spend less on health care, and we need to be more transparent, and there's a whole bunch of stuff we need to do. In fact, I think 
we should stop talking about it as the Affordable Care Act, not the Affordable right. Care Act. This is America's health care system. Mm -hmm. And how are we going to improve America's health care system? And I happen to think we have a better shot of doing it uh, without ripping out what we have root and branch. I know there are people that disagree with me. Obviously, yeah. Bernie has a different point of view. Why you? Why do you, why do you believe it? Look, at the end of the day, when you run for president, you got to make the case of why, why you think you're the person that can do it that maybe, and you're not trying, I'm not asking you to demean the other field, but why do you think you're best? Equipped? I would, I guess I'd say a couple things. One is I've watched this field roll out and a lot of these people are my friends. I was just going to say some of them you the, know very so well, John I know, Hickenlooper. I know, I'm going to get yeah, to that in a minute. I'm extremely Your cool. former boss. He's a, and he really, sometimes people say, was he that bad a boss <laughs> that you have to run against him for president? That's not the issue. We're very different people. Um, I have a, look, what compels me is the idea that we, our job as Americans is to provide more opportunity for the people coming after us. This economy is not working for most Americans. It hasn't worked for most Americans for, for 50 years. And the democracy cannot be sustained when there is no economic mobility, when no matter how hard you work, you can't move your You think our polarization ahead. is driven by this economic mobility? I think quality. it has a lot to do with it. And I think that the destruction of our institutions here also has a lot to do with it. Democracies do not do well when you have massive inequality and no economic mobility. And I think I've got the discipline to stay focused on that and to try to drive not just a message on that, but a set of policy ideas that could actually uh, change the outcome for the American people because they are unwilling to accept the idea that they have to live in an economy where nine out of ten Americans cannot benefit when we have economic growth. I have gotten the impression, and they shouldn't put up with it. I've gotten the impression that the longer you stay in the Senate, almost the angrier you've gotten at the institution. <laughs> Meaning that you're just so disappointed in what it isn't, versus obviously right. what I think you thought it could be. Yeah. You thought. You know, being the son of a diplomat, probably how you were raised to believe what the United States yeah. Senate was supposed to be. But the public doesn't care about those issues that much. How do you get the public to care about the process of the democracy? Yeah, I think they need to care about this because the Senate, whether the Senate is dysfunctional and a mess. I mean, look at yesterday. It's not, yesterday, look, you guys changed the rules. Nobody cared anymore. Nobody cared. We didn't even nobody, have a no, I, I, I had to barely, we had a fight to get it in I our know, show. I know, I know. I don't even know where to start here. Let me start on this. We spent four months. We're still spending time on $6 billion for the president's wall that Mexico is supposed to pay for. That's how the greatest nation in the world is spending our time as a democracy. China used more concrete between 2011 and 2013 than we did in the 20th century. Okay, that's $800 billion, I think, of concrete. We're spending all our time fighting over $6 billion of concrete. We got to radically change the conversation that we're having. And part of it is about fixing our institutions, because even though no one cares about process and even though everybody wants to throw up on this place, this is our mechanism for making decisions in a democratic republic. In our exercise in self-governance, the decisions are made in institutions like the Senate. And when they're broken and when they're corrupt, as they are right now, yeah. that should be an invitation not to be repelled by that, but an invitation to say, how do we come together as Americans and fix this? We have to fix it. it was if we cannot even, I'm telling you this, Chuck, we can't sustain another 10 years like the last 10 years. You know, we had a Democratic president for a big part of that time, mm -hmm. but he was disabled in the last six years, at least in the legislature, by the, by, by the tyrants who masquerade as the Freedom Caucus, who just want it done their way or, you know, it's it was, the highway. It was interesting. Yesterday, you, it, you, you basically apologized for going along with Harry Reid's idea I did. to get rid of the first, the fellow, which a lot of people warned that... Once you go one, now there's other cynics that say, oh, Mitch McConnell was going to change the rules anyway, so right. Reid should have had, right. had no choice. Right. I hear a lot of people say that, uh, that it was, a, that it was go going to happen Isn't anyway. You even heard McConnell yesterday basically saying, look, this has been a game of preemptive retribution, yeah. right? <laughs> that, that's my word, Actually, not his word. But, but, he, but, but that, that is true. But that, and it's what it's been. And, yes. and so when he says, I didn't allow Merrick Garland to go, which is, by, by the way, the biggest foul by far that, that has happened in the last uh, decades, and that's Mitch McConnell that did it. But, but he said the reason he did it was he knew that if the shoe were on the other foot, the Democrats would do it. That's the same thing as saying, well, you know, we shouldn't have invoked the nuclear or we had to invoke the nuclear option because they would have done it. The reality is time and time again, 
in our history, we have found ways to come together and preserve the decision making of these institutions. And and we've allowed our failure, frankly, to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's what we can't. The American people can't afford that. The kids in my old school district who are completely right. ignored by all this cannot afford I want to ask you one more time about John Hickenlooper. Why are you two running against each other? Yeah. Well, I don't think either but of us. But you are now, right? I don't, yeah, but I don't think either of us thinks we're running against each other. But don't, don't you hurt each other a little bit? No, well, I've, we probably hurt each other on the margin in terms mm -hmm. of fundraising at home. I suppose that's true. Right. But I think we've got very different points of view about all this. We've got very different uh, approaches and experiences. And um, I, as I've said to others, uh, I think the largest obstacles that John Hickenlooper and I are going to face in this race are not each other. There are, are other things that we're going to contend with, and I, and I, uh, I look forward to it. I think well, it's going to be great. Uh, the biggest thing you're contending with is your health. Uh, you look healthy. It sounds like you have a battle plan. Good luck, and we're going to be watching. Thank you. Right. I appreciate it. Stay Thanks safe for in the trail, man. All, All right. right. Good. Hello, YouTubers. If you're watching this, it means you've checked out our channel, so thank you. Now do me a favor. Subscribe by clicking on that button down there. Click on any of the videos to watch the latest interviews and highlights from MTP Daily and MSNBC. You can get more Beat the Press content every morning in the First Read newsletter. If you're tired of content that you don't know anything about where it came from, you don't have to have that problem with us. NBC News, MSNBC, MTP, and the Meet the Press mindset right here for you on YouTube. Subscribe now.